Welcome to our Eucharist at Christ Church on the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires, desires known, and, and from, from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. That, that we, we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through, through Christ, Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus saw the city and wept over it because it did not recognize the time of God's coming. Let us confess our part in the self-centeredness and blindness and sin of the life of our city and community. Let us confess our sins. Almighty God, our Lord Heavenly Father, Father, in penitence we, we confess, confess that we have sinned, sinned against you through, through our, our own fault, in thought, word, word and, and deed, and in what we have left undone, for the sake, sake of your Son. Jesus Christ our Lord, forgive, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to, to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon your sins and set you free from them, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God, who in generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire of your love, grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel, that always abiding in you, they may be found steadfast in faith and active in service, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is seen, what is unseen, is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Listen to the gospel proclaimed in the in, listen to the good news proclaimed in the gospel according to Matthew. Glory to Christ, Christ our, our Saviour. The kingdom of heaven is like a land over, owner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again at about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found still others standing around and asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. 
The workers, who were hired at about the eleventh hour, came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men, who were hired last, worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for Denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to Christ, Christ our Lord. Lord. Let us pray. Come to us, Lord, in the stillness and speak to our hearts, we pray, in your precious name. Amen. Our passage today speaks about death and some of the pain uh, of anticipation of death and what we might hope for. And as I was thinking through this and spending time in it, the thought struck me that we hear a great deal of talk at the moment, understandably, about death with COVID-19 and many, many ways in which we can escape the possibility of infection. And so all the things that are necessary, the social distancing, the uh, sanitizing, and so on, and all these are good. But curiously, I'm not sure that I've heard very much or anything about what to do with death, if it comes, and when it comes. You almost feel that if we use sanitizer and social distance for long enough, we might live for eternity. Um, <laughs> that death will not be able to reach us, um, which of course is an illusion. I want to suggest to you, though, that what Paul is giving us here is freshly minted as he thinks through his experiences and as he is thinking about God's mercy to him and pours his heart out to the readers of this letter. You see, Paul, as you will know if you've been reading through with us or know the book, Paul went through this time of profound, profound danger and thought that he would not escape alive or that his friends would escape with him. And he uses a series of terms to describe quite how serious it was. In many respects, maybe not unlike someone who is severely stricken with coronavirus and truly wonders if they're just going to turn the machines off. This man has really stared death in the face and was convinced he wouldn't come out, apart from a miracle. And this has had an amazing effect on this man, but there was one other thing too. And that is that into the Corinthian church had come people who, for whatever reason and however they argued the, their case, seemed to have life all buttoned up. So whether it was that they were following all the rules and the laws, or whether it was maybe their extreme apparent spirituality, because Corinth did uh, have exercise the gifts wonderfully, we don't know what they appealed to. But we do know that they looked down on weakness, looked down on vulnerability, looked down on not knowing, and so they shamed Paul and declared to Corinth that Paul was disqualified because he was a weak, broken man. 
and probably at times would say to them, I really don't know the answer to that. So Paul, on the one hand, was writing out of this profound experience of death and being delivered from death, but he was writing to people who were, on one level, unsympathetic to this. But something comes alive in Paul, and Paul seems to come to a new understanding. There's a very beautiful, there are many beautiful parts. He talks about us being like jars of clay, carrying about this light of God and life of God within us. So that in our weakness, when anything good comes out, people will know this is actually God's mercy and God's life flowing, not something that we pull off by our strength. But there's another very beautiful verse, which we could very easily miss, where Paul says that we are handed over, always being handed over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our bodies. And interestingly, this is the same term that is used of Jesus being handed over by Judas, handed over to the soldiers, handed over to death. So there's this amazing picture of this Messiah coming, becoming a weak human being, a frail, mortal human being, dying on the cross and so on. And we mirror that. And it's in our brokenness, our weakness, that we can hear God. And amazingly, at the end of this epistle, Paul actually says, when he's cried for help with something, his thorn in the flesh, he says, then I'll glory in my weakness, because in my weakness it gives the power of Christ the opportunity to rest upon me. Amazing stuff. I think the insights that Paul comes to here are because of his preparedness to admit his weakness, his fear of death, his fallibility, and to be profoundly vulnerable not only to his hearers, but himself before God. I want to just quote the words of someone who I have benefited from greatly, a woman who has worked extensively with people dying, a hospice worker, a very gifted woman. And she writes talking about how in her early visits she used to go to these homes and dread standing at the door because she knew what faced these people, the pain, the uh, the loss, the sadness, maybe the confusion of the person dying, the family members suffering. And she said as she drove around town and passed these houses one after another where she was helping people in their dying process, the words that went through her mind were tragedy, 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 and she'd be tempted to look the other way. But, she says, after a while, she came to realize that these were times when something profound was happening in the very people dying and in those who were there assisting them and loving them. And so she speaks of a change that, that took place in her thinking. She says, gradually, however, as I allowed myself to enter more intimately into this process of dying, to participate more closely in the great mystery at the edge of life and death, I noticed myself feeling great warmth, even smiling to myself as I passed houses in which someone I had come to know had died. Deep in the interior, behind those closed doors, often in the intimacy of a bedroom, I had been privileged to be part of moments of great depth. Deep in the interior, behind those closed doors, often in the intimacy of a bedroom, I had been privileged to be part of moments of great depth, moments in which it felt like invisible veils were parted to reveal an illuminated reality. Very lovely. And John O'Donoghue, the one-time Jesuit priest and also poet, 
says this. He says it's overwhelming sometimes to watch a person become more and more beautiful as they enter or near the kingdom of death. Though the body is worn, the countenance becomes infused with radiance. The words and silences are enveloped in a new dignity and freedom. And you begin to realize that already the graciousness of the eternal is infusing the last remnants of a life. You begin to realize that the graciousness of the eternal is infusing the last remnants of a life. Very lovely. And that's been my experience many times too. As you spend time with someone approaching death, they see in new ways. Their values change. And there's a depth and a luminosity oftentimes that comes about that hadn't been there before. I want to suggest Paul speaks to us here. This is exactly what has been going on in him. That these words that he writes and these, these several chapters are all like this overflow, overflowing praise to God. I think these words come out of this place of brokenness before the reality of death. Someone has said very rightly that the forces of, of darkness are not so much the things that trouble our society today, but the forces of shallowness. Hmm? It's hard for us to think about these things and to enter into them in ways that allows newness to come. Maybe that's always true of human beings. But this is what Paul calls us into here. Paul talks about two conflicting impulses or longings that we have. He says, in the meantime, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, our new body, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. On the one hand, we long to take on eternity. We long for newness. We long for closeness to God. We long for all those things that here on earth push us, if I may say so, to addictions. The hunger, the longing for closeness, intimacy, love, beauty, the things that come and go that we have no control over. And Paul says, on the one hand, we ache for this eternity. We ache for this transformation to be finally at home. But he says, on the other hand, we have another pain that we groan with, and that is that we do not wish to be unclothed. Now, on one level, Paul is talking about losing the bodies that we know. I have no doubt that that's true, and we'd be in between, so to speak. And who are we without our body? But I think it's very much more than that. I think Paul is talking about our being robbed of all the things which give us our sense of identity here on earth, our sense of, of, our, of, of, of safety, of um, familiarity and comfort, none of which are wrong. But as we pr approach death, we realize we will be stripped. I have to say, I know it will come, I know it must come, but I dread the day when we will have to leave our home. I dread the day that I will no longer have dogs to greet me, God, dogs to be with me, dogs to come and love me. I dread the day when I won't be able to walk down at one o'clock or two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning and walk out into the garden and gaze and enjoy the darkness, enjoy the nature. Usually when I've planted something new, then I, when I wake up in the night, which is frequently, I will then go out and have a look at it and enjoy it, either by torchlight or moonlight. Um, or to come down and to pull out a book of poetry or art or whatever it may be. 
I can't imagine no longer being able to do that. I can't imagine my deathbed. There's a part of us that fears being stripped of the familiar. But there's equally that part that longs to be with God. I remember a time when I was going through such difficulty that when I went to stay in a beach cottage for a few days, I didn't trust myself to go into the sea because my feelings of despair were so profound. I sincerely feared that I might just swim out as far as I could possibly go and know that I would not make it back. Paul is saying, we have these conflicting longings and forces within us. I think Paul is saying that as we embrace our longing for death, our fear of death, as we embrace the inadequacy of our lives here and the temporariness It will take us to a new place of perception. A very close friend of ours who lost an adult child wrote in her journal something like this after his death. Embrace your pain. Stay with it. Let it penetrate you deeply. And as you stay with it, your light will shine. Paul says, God has put his spirit within us. We have the beginnings of this life. And it's the fullness of this growth of true understanding of God and a different perspective, which is what he saved us for. Let's take a moment in silence. Let us pray. In humility and with a grateful heart, knowing we are unworthy, through the power of the Spirit and in our Saviour's name, let us pray to the Father. Lord, in our country, and the world that seems it seems to be moving further and further away from you. We pray for your spirit to touch the hearts of all people and draw them to the one truth, the gospel of our Lord. We particularly pray for the success of the Return South Africa prayer meeting on the 26th of September. At many hearts will be touched and many millions will return to you. Let us pray to the Father. Lord, have mercy. As we look at the possibility of returning to church, Lord, we pray for Ebenezer, our Bishop, for Tavo, our Metropolitan, and especially in our own community for Vic, Nicola, Ruth Ann and Nathan, for Simon and all the others who have guided and cared for us through these testing times. Let us pray to the Father. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy.
We are in a drought and the Eastern Cape is in desperate need of rain. There are millions suffering from malnutrition in our province alone. We give thanks for all involved in the distribution of food, whether soup kitchens or food parcels. But we ask for more donations, for more to be done by our provincial government, and for spring rains to nurture our crops and relieve the desperate hunger. Let us pray to the Father. Lord, Lord have mercy. mercy. We need wise and strong leadership in our land, province and city. We need a strong and vibrant country with an economy that is creating jobs for those who have lost their income source and those who never had one. We need leaders who will focus on only on achieving what is good and just for the people of South Africa. Let us pray to the Father. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. There are many who have been touched by the virus and others who have suffered in their health. Within our community, we ask for your healing hand on James Hoyle, Viv Ginn, Don Henry, Hilton Adonis, Barry and Maureen Phillips, Gary Griffith Smith, Anne Brocott, Solvay Martin, and Cabos Lindsay. Let us pray to the Father. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For our deliverance from all affliction, strife, and need, and for the absolution of our sins and offences, let us pray to the Father. Lord, have mercy. mercy. Remembering all who have gone before us in faith, and in communion with all the saints, we commit ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our God. Amen. Amen.
we invite you to come and share this Eucharist with us and to trust God to give to each one a spiritual Eucharist, even though we're not able to all partake of the elements. Jesus comes and loves us still. Wise and gracious God, you spread a table before us. Nourish your people with the word of life and the bread of heaven. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Worship and praise belong to you, Father, in every place and at all times. All power is yours. You created the heavens and established the earth. You sustain in being all that is. In Christ your Son, our life and yours are brought together in a wonderful exchange. He made his home among us, that we might forever dwell in you. Through your Holy Spirit, you call us to new birth, in a creation restored by love. As children of your redeeming purpose, we offer you our praise, with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, singing the hymn of your unending glory. and thanksgiving be to you, most loving Father, for the gift of your Son born in human flesh. He is the Word existing beyond time, both source and final purpose, bringing to wholeness all that is made. Obedient to your will, he died upon the cross. By your power you raised him from the dead. He broke the bonds of evil and set your people free to be his body in the world. On the night when he was given up to death, knowing that his hour had come, and having loved his own, he loved them to the end. At supper with his disciples he took bread, and offered you thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. After supper he took the cup. He offered you thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for you and for all that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me.
we now obey your Son's command. We recall his blessed passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and we look for the coming of his kingdom. Made one with him, we offer you these gifts, and with them ourselves, a single, holy, living sacrifice. Hear us, most merciful Father, and send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and this wine, that overshadowed by his life-giving power they may be the body and blood of your Son, and we may be kindled with the fire of your love and renewed for the service of your kingdom. Help us who are baptized into the fellowship of Christ's body to live and work to your praise and glory. May we grow together in unity and love, until at last, in your new creation, we enter into our heritage in the company of the Virgin Mary, the apostles and prophets, and of all our brothers and sisters living and departed. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour be to you, Lord of all ages, a world without end. Amen. As Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The living bread is broken for the life of the world. Lord, Unite, Unite us, us in this sign. sign. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your church with your perpetual mercy, and because without you our human frailty cannot but fail, keep us ever by your help from all things hurtful, and lead us to all things profitable for our salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Father Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Christ, who has nourished us with himself the living bread, make you one in praise and love, and raise you up at the last day, and the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Our Eucharist is ended. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.